Hey internet friends, Grace here. I was thinking about all these CEOs who've been stepping down in 2020 and also about the stock market and how it's plunged within recent weeks. As we have this economic stimulus package headed our way and the Fed is pumping trillions of dollars into our economy, I thought what better time to discuss a family who is intimately tied to the dollar. This family is as rich, if not richer, than the Rockefellers, yet they are not a household name. So let's spend this video talking about the Schiff family. Oddly enough, in order to speak about one of the richest families in America who hardly anyone knows about, we have to travel back to the Middle Ages, to a Jewish ghetto, where the Schiff family and the most notorious banking family, the Rothschild family, lived under one roof and continued to for centuries, intermarrying and essentially acting as one family. Which is where we meet Jacob Schiff, who was born in Frankfurt, Germany in 1847. At age 18, he set sail for New York, where he quickly made connections and moved up the ranks of the American banking industry. The Rothschild's now American cousin honed his finance skills and became a member of Kuhn Loeb, a European Jewish investment firm who emerged as one of the most influential firms of the industrial era. Having financed top industry tycoons including John D. Rockefeller and his expansion of Standard Oil, Jacob Schiff married into Kuhn Loeb, becoming head of the firm yet never changing the name. And additionally, Schiff became the director of the National City Bank of New York, Wells Fargo, and the Union Pacific Railroad. In 1907, he launched the Jewish Immigrants Information Bureau to encourage European Jewish immigration to the United States and successfully devised the Galveston Plan in which European organizations recruited Jewish individuals and transported them to Texas. While Schiff managed to change immigration laws for one group, he actively suppressed immigrants of other ethnicities and nationalities. Also on his resume, Schiff was one of the major financiers of the Bolshevik Revolution, which massacred millions of Christians across Russia. Once established as a financial titan, this Rothschild cousin quickly implemented the family formula. Jacob Schiff, alongside his brother-in-law, Paul Warburg, waged a relentless campaign for an American central bank. This banking crusade included giving speeches in front of New York's Chamber of Commerce, advocating for currency reform, with Jacob Schiff delivering a number of these speeches, making his intent perfectly clear. The main opposition to the Fed conveniently kicked the bucket a year before it was created. Rival millionaires like Jacob Astor, Isidore Strauss, and Benjamin Guggenheim sank along with the Titanic in 1912. JP Morgan was supposed to be on board but canceled at the last minute. What a coincidence, right? With Congress eager to take leave for the Christmas holidays, they passed the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 on December 23rd which called for the creation of the Federal Reserve Bank, a central bank of the United States that would oversee the nation's monetary policy. With the catch being that the Federal Reserve wasn't even part of the federal government, but a foreign banking system that doesn't even print the dollar bill. In 1933, Americans were required to deliver their gold to a Federal Reserve agent under the threat of criminal penalties. Meanwhile, the Schiff family maintained their status as banking titans, but eventually branched out to build a media empire. The granddaughter of Jacob Schiff, Dorothy Schiff, was owner and publisher of the New York Post for nearly 40 years. Also of note, the president of the Federal Reserve, Eugene Meyer, bought the Washington Post. Today, the Schiff family is as rich as ever and still highly connected, marrying into politics with a Schiff descendant wedding Vice President Al Gore's daughter. And while they've since divorced, you can see other members of the family intermingle between politics and Hollywood. To conclude here, we have a pattern that the Schiff family helped establish, and they've financially profited off of it ever since, making them one of the richest families in America. In 1913, a criminal cartel took control of a nation's monetary system. Respective families of this cartel bought and built media outlets, as well as purchased politicians to push the U.S. until World War I. Both sides of every war were and are funded by the same bankers. Fast forward to the Roaring Twenties. War was over and all the people with a little extra cash on hand got back into the financial market. Then the banks crashed the market once again, which prompted the Great Depression of the 30s. 
in which banking cartels bought up everything for pennies and to stabilize the economy, a problem they themselves created and already had a manufactured solution in place, rolled out the Emergency Banking Act of 1933. Then came World War II, which was promoted to every American through media channels the banking cartel owned and operated. Now we copy-paste, copy-paste the same formula for the Korean War, Vietnam, Gulf War, Afghanistan, Iraq, interventions in Syria, Yemen, and Libya. All of these wars are bankers' wars, sold to the American public through media on false pretenses. And what needs to be made absolutely clear is that the motivation behind this practice, this pattern, isn't just a magic piece of paper. Yo, what's up you dumb old hot dogs? I'm Devin, and I'm here to tell you about why the Federal Reserve is good. First, let's watch this educational film that the Federal Reserve made. Why should I love the Federal Reserve? Did you know that money is good? Well darn, that makes it clear. I like money, don't you? The Federal Reserve works with money, so obviously the Federal Reserve is good, dummies. Here's a cool fact, before the Federal Reserve came into existence, there were no Lamborghini owners in the United States. After the Federal Reserve came into existence, there are over 100 Lamborghini owners in the United States. Don't listen to Really Graceful, support the Federal Reserve, and you can trust me. If I'm lying, then I hope someone throws a brick right into my face. <laughs> Ow! Call, ni call 911! Somebody call 911! Put the camera down, Darren! Call 911! Now, I can already anticipate some of the reactions that I might receive as a result of pointing out someone's religious affiliation, whether that be Christian, Mormon, Muslim, Wahhabi, whatever. No one ever has a problem with it until I mention Talmudic Judaism, which is taught through a rabbinical text called the Babylonian Talmud and was compiled in the year 500. The Talmud said some pretty interesting things about the treatment of Gentiles, but Talmudic rabbis refute this observation by saying anti-Semites take these direct quotes about Gentiles and even the Talmudic view of Christ out of context. From Bethlehem to Babylon or modern day Iraq is over 600 miles, quite a haul from where Judaism has its roots. At the core of Judaism is the covenant with Moses and the covenant with Abraham. The holy text is the Torah. There are plenty of Jews who would not touch the Talmud with a 10-foot pole. They strictly abide by the Torah. I am not talking about those people. It's incredibly important that I make this distinction. I am not talking about your neighbors. I am not talking about the people you see in your grocery store. I am not talking about you normal person who is just living your life. What I am talking about is a mindset, not even an ethnicity, because no one here can help how or where they were born. But what is within our control is how we treat people and what we do with this time we are given. So I'm talking about the continuum of Babylon, not Jerusalem. People who see themselves as one tribe to rule over all the others. A people who have claimed this religious identity but are clearly of Eastern European descent or Ashkenazi ancestry who are thought to have made conversions to Judaism while under the Khazarian kingdom around the same time the Babylonian Talmud was being compiled. And a lot of these folks ended up in Poland and then Germany. So anyway, I can already feel the ADL putting me on a list, but it has to be said, not from a place of hatred, but from a place of hope for humanity. All the things I've covered in this video and the events we are seeing play out on the world stage, even right now, today, is the logical culmination of Babylon debt slavery. The name Babylon can be translated to the gates of the gods, not God with a big G, but gods with a little g, whom some might call fallen angels. The Bible talks about Babylon a lot, calling it the dwelling place of demons, a place of death, slavery, and blood rituals. Compound interest is literally Babylonian mathematics. It's inscribed on ancient tablets. Usury is Babylon. In other words, ancient Babylon was all about loaning you 50 bucks if you paid them back $75. These practices yielded a society in which 80 to 90% of the population had nothing. A tiny fraction of the population had something, and 0.00001% of people had everything. The majority of the population was composed of people who were working just to barely financially get by. 
basically just working to be able to afford to live. This is debt slavery. Can we draw any parallels to modern society here? Oh, and by the way, did I say Palestine or Egypt was all about loaning you $50 as long as you paid back $75? No, I didn't, so please spare me on accusations of anti-Semitism. America was never supposed to be home to this debt slavery system. The American founders talked about this a lot. America was intended to be an even playing field where everyone could succeed not lose their houses over fluctuating interest rates in a manufactured mortgage crisis. Do you hear how absurd that sounds? The money was always supposed to be backed in something tangible like gold or silver, but instead we have magic paper money backed by nothing except the confidence to exchange it for goods and services. And our whole financial system is controlled by people who have no allegiance to us. They use compound interest tricks with fake money that is backed by absolutely nothing. They can print as much of it as they want and flood our markets with dollars under the guise of saving us. But you cannot save someone from a problem that you yourself created. You are not the hero here, you are, you are the villain. So to put it all into perspective, a Rothschild cousin came to America and made quick work of overturning America's monetary system. In 1910, in total and complete secrecy, Schiff and his buddies traveled to an island off the coast of Georgia called Jekyll Island, where the Rockefellers already had a residence. And there just so happened to be a huge Native American burial ground in their front yard. There was a Native American tribe who once inhabited Georgia's islands. And historians have noted that an ancient Canaanite altar once existed on Jekyll Island and was the location of ritual sacrifice. A tidbit which is used to explain why the original members of the Fed chose Jekyll Island of all places to plan the country's monetary policy. In fact, in 1892, the Atlanta Constitution reported they had found a mound in that area that contained one frame of a nine-foot-tall human who must have been a very near relative of old Goliath, which is a direct quote. <laughs> Goliath in the Bible is recorded as a nine foot tall giant and biblical scholars regard Goliath as a Nephilim descendant of Canaan. People tend to label this sort of talk as a bunch of malarkey, just total fantasy, but think about it. People have died, are dying, and will die for a dollar, a piece of paper backed by absolutely nothing tangible, nothing. Just open up your wallet and look at the iconography on the dollar bill. Just pull out your wallet and look at a dollar bill. We have a pyramid with an eye on top of it. And underneath, Novus Ordo Seclorum, meaning the new secular order or new order for the ages. These visual metaphors relate to the same kind of debt slavery, usury, and compound interest that America was never supposed to have. And historically, this banking cartel has silenced anyone who has challenged their control. Like Napoleon with his Bank of France or Lincoln with his greenback or even JFK and Gaddafi tried to introduce the gold denier. Look at what happened to these people. And now Trump deals with them. And there have been moments throughout his presidency where he's been incredibly critical of the Fed. And even as recently as yesterday, the Fed admitted to manufacturing this economic crisis we face during this period of pandemic. So it will be very telling to see how Trump responds. And just to wrap it all up here, Mystery Babylon isn't such a mystery, is it? The Federal Reserve has created unimaginable private wealth like the familial wealth of the Schiff family. But like I said before, it's not all about that dollar dollar bill, y'all. It's about control. And control is directly at odds with freedom, one of America's most cherished values. These are the families who sit on top of everything, who don't want to be noticed, but there are no families or corporations or governments higher than them as the governments and corporations are completely at their mercy. So what do you think, internet friends? You know, I always look forward to your comments. Thank you so much for subscribing and supporting me on Patreon. Bye. But I have a secret. I'm just a fake silhouette, avoiding every threat.